Whoa, I got, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, 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 don't break the freaking rail. Jeez, I got him hammered off that. Holy cow. Took the rod out of my hand. Oh, it's another big fish. Holy moly. Don't you jump. Don't you jump. Hey folks, Paul Roberts here with our next video fishing journal, uh, number 32. This one follows up on our current laboratory pond uh, introduced in our previous journal, uh, number 31. I'd planned several fishing goals for this summer and sadly, uh, no tragically, <laughs> I didn't get to most of them, uh, which hurts. <laughs> uh, every year as I come to realize more and more just how darn short the micro seasons and scenarios out there really are. One of those goals for this summer was to contrast last summer's investigation of a heavily weeded water body, um, uh, journals 20 to 23, by exploring a water body that sports an open water, virtually cover-free fishery. My hope was that this would uh, lead us to offshore fishing, fishing some offshore structures. Structures that one cannot see by eye. Many people think that small waters have only shoreline fishing, uh, shoreline related fishing, and, and, and that offshore or deep water fishing is relegated to large lakes. Where offshore structures exist, even in small waters though, the fishing can be much the same as it is on big waters. Uh, and I wanted to show some of that. That was the plan anyway. <laughs> However, such plans require that all players, the fish, the conditions, and circumstances are on board. After putting some serious time into it, uh, adding a 15 hour and a 11 hour day this summer to what we saw in Journal 31, I suspect that this water body may not be, uh, currently anyway, the best place to spend our time to explore offshore fishing. Upon pulling out of the water after that long 11 hour day, I got into a conversation with another angler uh, named, named Billy, who also happened to be a subscriber. Um, that was pretty cool. I enjoyed talking with him, in part because he was flat honest about his fishing there. Uh, so we were able to be pretty much on the same page right away and share observations. Uh, very cool, uh, very much appreciated. Uh, as we started talking, I, I, I was pulling out and I said, this is a tough fishery. And he responded, yeah, and, and what's with this place? I either catch a big one or nothing. Those big ones sure keep me coming back, but it, it's tough, it's tough fishing. And I told him I was experiencing the very same thing. I found if I go finesse, I can add a bunch of eight to 10 inches to the catch, a bunch, <laughs> with a few 11 to 14s uh, sprinkled in. While fishing, I found myself saying, where are the two pounders? Uh, the lunkers are nice, but few and far between. Where are those, those two pound fish? It appeared that there is a gaping hole in the size year class structure in this pond, uh, likely explained by that massive flood that breached the pond roughly seven years ago. There simply may not be enough quality sized fish out there to warrant my using this pond to try and demonstrate uh, offshore structure fishing. So with a possible gap in the size structure of our pond, I wrote back to my regional warm water biologist. I wanted to know whether I just wasn't finding a chunk of the population, those mid-sized two pound class fish that fisheries managers call quality sized bass, or were they just not there? Was it me or the pond? <laughs> Ever had to ask that question? <laughs> Here's his brief and helpful reply. <laughs> Where did I put it? Hi, Paul. The pond was breached by the flood in 2013, and it took three years to repair. We did not do our supplemental stocking until things were back to normal. Okay, now that's helpful. There was very likely poor natural reproduction post-flood in that heavily muddied water. That water, that water body being wind exposed also saw those sediments continue to roll up 
uh, for the next couple of years. The very thing that killed off the vegetation and had me going elsewhere for my fishing um, after that flood. Now, we're six and a half years post-flood and uh, I or we are revisiting that water. On top of the likely break in natural reproduction that occurred, no supplemental stocking was done for two seasons. Supplemental stocking, uh, by the way, is light stocking uh, that supplements natural reproduction to help maintain relatively consistent fishing in heavily fished waters uh, like this one, upping the odds that there will be up and coming year classes of fish each year. Uh, natural reproduction success is always variable, but especially so in small waters. So this info likely explains the apparent hole in this size structure in this pond. Looking at growth rates here, uh, which are pretty typical for most northern bass, allows me then to count back to when given fish were likely hatched. And where the spawn failures, the holes are likely to, be, to, to have occurred. And in this pond, that was those two spawning stocking seasons uh, immediately post-flood. In most of my waters, especially those that rely on natural reproduction alone, I've learned to adjust my expectations to the vagaries of each water's ability to produce year classes of bass. In many waters, and especially so in small waters, this not uncommonly results in what I call boom and bust fishing. So to keep track, I try to make note of the bass populations uh, of all sizes in the waters, uh, in my waters as I fish, uh, watching for and then keeping track of uh, strong year classes, uh, those good spawn years. I then calculate forward for when those fish should be reaching catchable quality and possibly lunker size. As a general rule of thumb, it takes about four years here for a bass to reach adult size, roughly 12 inches. Growth varies, of course, across water bodies, seasons, and individuals. But a flat average of rule of thumb here, and in many northern waters, is approximately an inch and a half of growth per year after reaching maturity. An 18-inch bass, then, is on average eight years old, uh, if a given bass makes it that far. And that depends, of course, on food, uh, prey availability, and, um, uh, and predation on, on those bass as they're, as they're growing. So here's the size distribution of my catches in this pond in graphic format. And, and no, I don't usually uh, graph my catches, <laughs> um, but in this particular case, it's illustrative. And here also is a back calculation to see where the break in year class production occurred. Now, are my catches representative of who's really in there? Uh, you know, how, how good's my data? Knowing the pond's history, that catastrophic flood that occurred in the fall of 2013, uh, and those stocking records, I think it's highly probable that there truly is a hole in the size distribution of bass in this pond. That hole happens to currently fall in what's generally considered the quality size bracket for, ba bracket for bass. Uh, fish that are both large enough and numerous enough to keep most anglers casting uh, while awaiting those generally rarer big ones. By following your classes, I can take my best stab at being on waters that provide the best chances for good fishing or, or for the type of fishing I want to pursue on any given outing. So that's where we stand in this pond. Uh, uh, essentially what I found that I was doing out there uh, was awaiting the big ones, but without much in the way of quality sized rewards in between. Um, consistent enough rewards, that is, that could make for a good demonstration of offshore fishing techniques. I spent two long days, and that's the way summer days are, <laughs> A week apart. The first at the tail end of pre-summer. Uh, the second at the, the beginning of summer. 
on day one, the water temps are in the low to mid 70s, roughly uh, 73 degree core throughout the water column uh, due to wind exposure, uh, wind mixing, and no thermocline. Uh, the surface temperature is peaking at 77 Fahrenheit. Those upper 70s are important in my experience, um, appearing to signal the waning of that pre-summer binge and its aggressive high energy fish. Uh, those high energy fish tend to coincide with water temperatures in the mid 70s. What I do uh, is I watch the behavior of the bass that I'm observing and catching. And small bass often tip me off to the energy level of the bass in general in that pond by their willingness to chase a fast lure and their willingness and exuberance in jumping. And again, I look for this as I fish, speed testing the small abundant fish to get a bead on their energy level. Uh, uh, that might and often does hold for the larger fish as well. More specifically, I've come to recognize certain temperatures that coincide with such energized fish, often revealed by their willingness and sheer exuberance to jump clear of the water. You have to be on your toes to keep such aggressive leapers hooked. <laughs> I've come to call 77 degrees Fahrenheit the peak jumping temperature for largemouth bass. Similarly, I've recognized the same thing in brown trout at 57 Fahrenheit. Fish, of course, may jump at any temperature. I've had browns jump in 40 degree uh, water, and, and I once had a steelhead leap clear uh, in super cooled water. That's water under the freezing temp. <laughs> That's like 31, 31 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. But these are rare occurrences. Jumping temps appear to be peaks in the bass's willingness to jump and the sheer athleticism of those jumps. You'll see what this looks like here shortly, uh, including one heartbreaker that simply physically beat me to the punch near the end of uh, uh, that 15 hour day on the water. Uh, yeah, that hurt. But oddly enough, the pain was dulled by my tiredness and I seem to be able to remain philosophical about it. <laughs> yeah, that fish beat me. She earned her freedom. Uh, more power to her. On day two, uh, a week later, the water column is a couple of degrees higher at 70, uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, that's the core with surface temperatures breaking 80 now. Um, uh, I had a 81 degree uh, peak on that day, surface temperature. And aggression levels seemed lessened. Uh, fish, uh, those young fish again, uh, take mostly on retrieve pauses. So I end up going with that. Uh, after fast retrieves simply fail. The pre-summer binge is likely over at that point, uh, unless perhaps we get an extended cold, cold spell. Uh, that's been known to happen. Uh, see video fishing journal number five uh, for an example of this. Okay, how much do I describe here <laughs> going in? Uh, always a challenge to share cool stuff, but not overwhelm viewers or, or myself. So we'll start with uh, um, an apt question, where are the fish? <laughs> uh, and in this case, shoreline or offshore? And the answer is both, not surprisingly. My sonar was alive with fishes of all sizes uh, throughout the water column, with most though grouped at the four to six foot level on or sus uh, suspended out away from the shoreline shelves. Similarly, some fishes held on or suspended off of uh, some, offshore, some of the offshore structures as well at the eight to 10 foot level. A and some were on the bottom two at eight to 11. That's just below the uh, edge of the drop, the bottom of the drop off those offshore structures. Almost none were deeper, um, although no thermocline existed. I found small fish nearly everywhere, and small bass were seen attacking young of the year fishes in open water, uh, both near the surface where I could physically see them, uh, and on sonar. These open water young of the year were likely gizzard shad, bluegills, and bass. And, and, and they're, they're, uh, uh, the fact that they're open water fish is, is a, a part of their life history strategy during this time of year. Benthic, that's bottom-oriented prey, would be young of the year perch, 
carp, and channel cats. Um, and, and also, uh, as we discovered in, in Journal 31, crayfish are potentially important in this pond um, and, and turned out to be, and you'll see, uh, uh, some of which uh, I was able to recover by lavage, uh, that stomach pumping from the stomachs of a few small bass that I, uh, that I sampled. I spent some time fishing offshore structures uh, on the first day, uh, but did not turn any mature fish. Uh, I found a couple roughly 13-inch bass at one end of the island relating to a point bar. Uh, I found uh, two big fish, and a shoreline angler caught a big one too, along shoreline shelf edges. But all the better fish came from edges that dropped into deeper water. And in this pond, uh, this is a subtle distinction. All shelf, all shelves drop, um, uh, all shelf drops in this pond are steep. Okay, uh, but some drop into somewhat deeper water than others. Again, this was a, a subtle distinction, as the difference was the actual steepness and only a two-foot difference in uh, uh, depth at the bottom of those, those shelves. Some semblance of cover or, or objects were also present uh, at these uh, fish holding spots too, uh, which ended up being the spots on the spot. These are few and far between and quite small in this pond of tough to find with my standard uh, and narrow beamed sonar. The two 13ers, 13 inches that I caught um, uh, came off a sunken branch, probably left by a beaver, um, by beavers, um, on a steep drop along uh, a point bar. All three big fish were caught near tall shoreline trees. One of these had some large uh, these these spots had some had some large rock present, um, and the other uh, a six plus pounder was caught in front of a beaver lodge. Uh, beavers not only create awesome woodpile uh, lodges at shore edges, but they also uh, stockpile branches underwater for their winter feeding for when the water ice is over. Um, and uh, so so if you see a, a, a beaver pond or a, a beaver lodge, uh, that's not the only cover in the place usually. Often there is a stockpile of stash somewhere uh, close by. Um, and um, by summer, they're often whittled down, but, um, but there's still stuff down there. So, you know, it's possible to get snagged on the, be the beaver lodge. It's also possible to get snagged out from the beaver lodge. Um, but um, it's also a potentially uh, uh, good fish holding spot. I also plied the immediate shoreline as water levels remained high, keeping the, those shoreline willows flooded. I wasn't rigged for heavy flipping, so I probed the edges and uh, skipped into and under that cover wherever I could. This yielded only one decent bass um, and some spawning channel cats. Uh, channel cats uh, nest in some type of uh, reclusive overhead cover, holes, crevices, um, and undercuts. Um, and, and if it's available, often under dead fallen wood. The males, male cats, guard their eggs and fry, sort of like bass do. And I caught one cat, uh, I, I believe a female, beneath an overhanging deadfall, and, and another, a male, uh, uh, beneath some undercut willows. That second fish, that second cat, was a beast, uh, a nearly black uh, guarding male who gave quite a fight uh, with me trying to keep him from getting back into his undercut and taking my jig and a chunk of line with him. I tell you this because I, I managed to miss recording that wild initial part of the battle, uh, me trying to kick away from that shoreline to tow that fish out into open water. Uh, I think I fought that fish with my swim fins as much as I did with the rod. Uh, I just didn't have the camera on when I made that cast. <sighs> okay, that's the background on what we're about to see. Let's hit the water. Yeah, oh, I just got chased up. Oh, it's a trout. No, it isn't. It's a bass. Just it's another slim, pink-bellied bass. Jeez. Yep, yep, yep. Tis jumping season.
I'll be darned. I've got a freaking fish. <laughs> oh. Jump. I've got a good bass. I let her go. I let her go. That was a big fish. Those were good hooks. <laughs> oh, Paul. That was a good fish. That was a five pound fish. Boy, there's a lot of little hungry bass in here. Okay, that's what's in these little bass. Craws. I might have to take this. There's one. And it's big. Uh, uh, unless I got a cat. <laughs> and that's. Unless I. I'm not going to say anything. It's staying down. And it's a cat because I think I can feel that ripple. Come on. Come on, get up. Too many crayfish eaters in here. Yeah, it's turning. It's a shovel head. Oh man, here we go. Who do we got? He didn't try to jump, so. It's a bass. <laughs> Yeehaw. Sorry, I think I'm blocking the action here. Oh, it's a big, the large mouth. Oh, it's a very big, large mouth. Pond record for sure. Whoa, get out from under my boat. I got an anchor down, honey. Oh, that is a six pound fish. Don't let her jump. <clears throat> well, maybe not six. Close. Yeah, she's probably six. Whoa, come on. And a little tiny mouth. Holy moly. Oh. There we go. That is what they call a lunker. And she's been caught before. Or hooked before. Whoa, nothing in her throat. <sighs> All right, I'm gonna keep you hooked for this moment. Sweet pea. I wish I had a better set of clippers here, but we'll go under the jaw right there. Oh boy. Just see before she jumps. Six and 
come on, hon. Six and a quarter, six and a third. Is a gorgeous fish. Mm. How long might you be? I don't have any marks on the rod. I guess I'll have to do that. All right, hon. Mm. She was well hooked. Oh, yes. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, hon. Sweet pea, let's get you back in. There you go. That's what this is, the trophy fishery. I don't know where all the two, three pounders are. I gotta talk to the biologist again. Got some history here. It feels like there's a hole in the ear classes. off that holy cow took the rod out of my hand oh it's another big fish holy moly don't you jump don't you jump I feel like I gotta put pull this anchor up but stay on her stay on her whoa 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 I just felt my swim fins move. Wow, I can't budge this one. Okay, okay. Yeah, my drag's okay, I think. Nice stretch in that line, I can feel it. Whoa. I'm gonna drop that drag back a little bit. Let's hope that single hook is in. Okay, maybe this one's a cat. Whoa! Whoa! It's gotta be a cat. <laughs> Don't get in my anchor line, whatever you do, honey. I wanna at least see you. now. That's cat-like. That's cat-like. <sighs> yep, cinder block with fins. Whoa. Whoa, you're trying to stay down. You are. Look at those boils. Holy cow. I foul the carp. Nah, it felt like it was a strike. That's a cat. I don't want any shorter a line. That's a big cat. Oh, man. I should get my anchor line up. Keep backing the drag off. Let her run a little. I'd like to get... The, oh, there, I can see her now. That was... That's a cat. I can see that long tail. Yep, it's a cat. Jeez. <laughs> Cat on a crankbait. Come on, you. Pick it up. Do I have to take you to shore? 
Whoa, whoa, get out from under my boat. There we go. Hmm, how am I gonna deal with you with a... Nope, 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 no, nope, no, you don't. Uh, let's go to shore. I'm gonna give you some slack. I'm gonna pull my anchor up. Alright, let's do this. Don't lose the rod, whatever you do. Let her hang down below. We're going to shore. Come with me. I wish it was a bass, dirt it. <laughs> Take her up here. All right, all right, all right. How are we gonna deal with you? Oh, don't move, honey. Don't move, honey. Shoot. That hook is really in there. This is freaking dangerous. All right, we're gonna do it a different way. Give me this. Oh boy, need pliers for this one. Okay, wait a minute, slack up, roll it over. It's double hooked. Oh man. All right, let's get this out of the way. And take a look at her. Oh. Yeah, about the same size as the other one. you back. Sorry to mess up your day. <sighs> Gotta retie that knot again, do I? <sighs> oh, man. <laughs> he was back in there all right. anyway. Sure, jump again. Thirteener. So there's one of them sort of middle-sized bass, small to middle. Boy, you've been caught before too. Wow. Well, I had a, another cat come out of the, the dense cover. Uh, I thought I had my cameras on, and it was a heck of a fight to get it out of there. I had to kick to open water. Oh, let's see if I can get you. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> come on. Come on, I want my jig back. How are we going to do this? Man. Oh. Okay, don't cut your fingers again and don't pierce your boat. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, let's try this on for size. <laughs> All right, right, we'll unhook you. Wow, you are well hooked, honey. Ouch. Mm -hmm. All right, we're putting you right back. There you go. Slime rocket. Came right out of the 
cover there. So they're, they're spawning. I don't know if they tend broods like bullhead do. They, they do seem to tend their nests. There's one. Nope, there is something solid. Let's see if it'll... <sighs> I got one or a stick. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> There's one on the tail hook, finally. He's not coming unpinned. Finding a few smalls here. Smalls, but not tinies. Oh, look at you. You've got a hook in you. And quite a belly. Yeah, you got a real swallowed hook. Somebody cut you free. I'm glad they did. You got a belly and you've got a scar right across here. And, and that looks like a cormorant scar right across there. Hair and a cormorant when you were young. You're a lucky thing. Adios. All right. Anybody home? There we go. I got thumped, and it's a good bass. Jump again, are you? Hey, there's my two-pounder. <laughs> Finally. Tired of these fours and sixes. Okay, come on. Come on, hon. Ta-da. Okay, pound and three-quarter. the maxillary. Come on, baby. There. And thin. All right. Things are coming alive. <sighs> Beaver. That's what it is, it's the beaver, okay. All right, fella. Hooking my fish, man.